Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session. My name is Danny Blade. I'm here to have a nice fireside chat about the fire um, with Romy Grossberg. Uh, Romy is an Australian-born writer who spent more than three years living in Phnom Penh and uh, where she was the manager of the only hip-hop centre in the country that worked with disadvantaged children and young people. In 2013, Romy moved to Thailand to write uh, about her work and her experience um, of the hip-hop underworld in Cambodia. She has had short stories published in Hong Kong and in various magazines across Asia. Um, and she's also a writer for Travel Fish. Please welcome Romy. <laughs> now, Romy, you and I caught up the other day. You ordered tea for the first time in a restaurant. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. Um, so, from our chat, it you know, made my job a little bit more difficult because I don't know where to start. So, I threw a dart on the board and I decided to start with Cambodia. Okay. All right. So, how did you come to be working in a strange place like Cambodia? Um, at the time, I was, what was I doing? It was 2010, beginning of 2010, I was studying my master's in international public health at Monash University. Um, I'd already been working for about 10 years as a counsellor, a social worker in mental health, drug and alcohol and homelessness in St Kilda. So um, at the time I really knew that what I wanted to be doing was uh, international development and community development work. So I'd done some volunteer stints in Vietnam in art therapy and working with street kids there. I'd spent six months working on a WHO World Health Organisation community development project in India and I kind of knew that my path needed to go kind of Africa, Asia was always the dream um, and then I actually rang some friends who worked at Amnesty International and Oxfam and Red Cross and all the big NGOs and asked them to look around the room and tell me what kind of, what kind of qualifications people in that room had to be doing what they were doing. So. Uh, he said that most of them had started their masters, none of them had finished, <laughs> and all of them had uh, experience. So I thought, okay, well, let's try both. So I started my masters, and I was almost halfway through, and I was actually really loving it, except for biostatistics. I don't recommend that at all. And, um, and I started applying for jobs, and at the time I got a job offer in East Timor, working with a group of soccer uh, China sort of put together soccer as a way of working with disadvantaged youth, which was something I believed strongly with and had done a lot of work with soccer in the homeless uh, community with the big issue, so it was something I was really passionate about. I was also offered a job in Uganda uh, working with schools and helping mentorship programs, and I was offered this one in Cambodia working with uh, street kids using hip hop to work in the slums. So, I mean, that was a really tough decision. All three jobs were amazing, and I really didn't know what to do. So I did what everyone should do. I went to the wall off Carlisle Street, and I told everyone that I didn't know. And we all talked about it. <laughs> so, and then I was in Cambodia. And it only dawned on me at some point later that I thought I was mad. I, I hadn't thought it through. I started packing up. I don't even know at what point I remember to tell mum and dad. I just started packing up my stuff and moving out. And, um, and I was living in an apartment in St Kilda. And I started packing up, started saying goodbyes and ended up meeting another author, a friend of mine, who was in Thailand. And he said, come here for a holiday first. So I went over for a holiday for two weeks. I didn't really say goodbye to anyone when I left Australia. I kept telling myself, you're only going on a two week holiday, so don't worry about it. And I didn't think anything else because it seemed too overwhelming otherwise. So I did my two week holiday in Thailand. And I actually still remember being in the taxi on the way to the airport in Koh Samui. And I burst out crying and I totally freaked out. And I thought, what the hell am I doing? And I really wanted to come back to Australia and say goodbye to everybody properly because I felt that I brushed off everyone and not actually said goodbye. And then the next thing I knew it, I was landing in Phnom Penh in summer. I don't recommend that either. <laughs> it was really hard. And um, it was 40 degrees and I was being sent to work. So yeah, that's how I ended up there. And so now tell us, what did you actually do there? Um, I was the manager 
um, of Tiny Tunes, which is a hip hop center working with street kids in the slums. So we moved centers a bunch of times. Um, right now we're in Chibampo, which is really proper slums, which is great. That's where we should be. Um, I was the general manager, but in a place like Cambodia, you're the everything. You know, my, most of the kids there called me mum, the older ones called me auntie, uh, a lot of the girls called me sister. So I was the one that got you in trouble and held your hand at the same time. So it was quite, quite a bizarre relationship to, you know, scold someone and then want to take them home and make sure they're okay. Particularly when a lot of the kids that I worked with were drug users and alcoholics, ex-gang members. So I'm a big believer in recovery and people not living a lifetime of sentence. So it was really difficult to scold someone for drug use and to deal with their drug use when I also wanted to kind of pick them up and carry them home and tell them that everything would be okay. So I was a mixture of, of everything. And, and so what do the students actually do? What do they study? Okay, so Tiny Tunes is a, it's a drop-in centre, which I actually learned living overseas that drop-in is the only is only very much an Australian term, and no one else knew what I was talking about. So um, it's a drop-in centre where disadvantaged kids, whether they come from backgrounds of family violence, uh, extreme poverty, <clears throat> um, drugs, alcohol, gangs, kids can come from the age of about four years old to 25, and it's a free centre. It's open Monday to Friday. And whilst they're there, we use hip hop as the way of engaging. So break dancing, hip hop, DJing, uh, art therapy. So it's all kind of really dance therapy, art therapy, but without using that terminology. People would come because it was cool. You're reaching an underground world of people that you can't engage with in any other way. You can't walk up to a street kid who has no money, no education, no home and say, hey, do you want to go to school? You know, it, it just doesn't work that way. So um, we use hip hop and breakdance as a way of engaging with these with, with these guys. And then whilst they're in the centre, you could really see the growth within them and the empowerment that they that they had and the families that were created within the centre. And through that, you would have kids then coming and saying, "I want to go back to school." So we also had an education program teaching English and Khmer language, maths, <coughs> computer. Um, and often life skills. So we would teach health education, hygiene, HIV, drug and sex education in the hope that we could kind of get them back the life skills that they never learnt at home and also increase their education to a level that they were able to then actually re-enter the school system and we would provide scholarships to get them there. My, my memory of Cambodia, um, one of the memories is um, uh, the advice of don't uh, give money to the kids that are hanging around simply because you're keeping them out of school. Yeah. Um, so legally, they don't have to, it seemed they didn't have to be at school and sometimes their parents or their carers were pushing them out onto the street to make some money. So it sounds like it was an added incentive for these kids to have your organisation supporting them and putting some structure around. Yeah, definitely. Um, I agree with you. I think uh, handing out money is not the solution. It, helps for 10 seconds and that's about it and it does keep people on the streets because it's almost a way of living that's their version of going to work so it, it doesn't solve any problems having the center there helps you know a full all-rounder education to help them actually want to believe in themselves again when we moved centers and we did often because we were always evicted when we'd move into a new center we would go and talk to all the families in the village that we were in and the parents were so excited because they couldn't afford to send their kids to school. So all of a sudden you had all these kids that wanted to come and all these parents. And it was beautiful. You would have parents, it was quite amazing. They would come and line up. We had to almost implement a structure of enrollment and we didn't have anything like that. This is Cambodia. And we would design an enrollment that looked somewhat official and it wasn't, but it looked that way so that the parents and the kids knew that they were actually making a commitment to send their kids there. And the mothers would dress up and the kids, and their version of dressing up, you know, the kids would wear shoes for the first time ever. They would borrow someone's shoes from the family to show they were serious about education. And it was really quite a beautiful thing and they would come and just put their thumbprint because most of them were illiterate and they didn't know how to sign their name or write something down, so we had all these thumbprints. And we didn't care about the thumbprints, we cared about them knowing that they were committing to something special. Um, 
working with um, maligned and perhaps desperate communities in developing countries, I think some people would agree, is not the normal pathway for a nice Jewish girl from Melbourne. <laughs> so what was your motivation to be doing that and not doing <clears throat> something else that may be a bit safer and maybe a bit more lucrative? Um, I think for those that know me in the room, which is a few, I was never the good, normal Jewish girl, and it was just never going to happen. Um, I remember when I applied to photography school in my last lifetime being asked what kind of Jewish girl goes and studies photography. So uh, that was considered weird, so definitely moving to Cambodia was really considered weird. Um, to be honest, I think my reputation allowed me to also. People, most people's responses would be like, oh God, only Romy would do something like that. And, and it was kind of accepted because Romy always did anything that was completely against the grain. So it actually helped me in a way. Um, but I always felt that there was more. I, I, I struggle sitting in Melbourne and just being and living this lifestyle and going to work. I've been here a week and I feel stressed out. <laughs> it's cold and everyone's in a hurry and there's traffic and... And it's, just, it's different, but yeah, I, I never quite fit in, I guess. Um, certainly not to the Jewish community anyway, even though I was big in Maccabi, I was president for many years. So the Maccabi world I fit into, and Hubbo as a teenager I fit into, but the Melbourne Jewish community as a whole was just not somewhere I sat comfortably. So going out into Asia, Asia always felt very much home for me. Um, so we're all aware of the Khmer Rouge and the destruction that they caused, but it was a relatively short period of time that they were in power in the, in the late 70s. Um, is it safe to say that Cambodia has moved on? Well, it depends what you mean by moved on. Um, the Khmer Rouge was 75 to 79. Um, they've had a lot of civil wars since then in 81 and 83, so they've not quite moved on. Uh, if you were to go to Phnom Penh today, to the capital, it might look like a normal city. <laughs> you know, I look around now and I don't recognise a lot. There's lots of fancy buildings and fancy cars, and but it's all about status. A lot of people have the shiny SUV cars that no one can afford, but they do it because it looks good and everything is about saving face, about reputation, about status. But if you look kind of behind all of that, you'll see that Cambodia is still very much a, an underdeveloped country and the rich have gotten a whole lot richer, but the poor are still just as poor and we have just as many kids at centres like Tiny Tunes. And it's a matter of really people just wanting to sort of sweep it under the rug and, and not let it be seen. Yeah. So you're, you're obviously drawn to the experience of Cambodians. Did you consciously or maybe even subconsciously make any kind of link to your Jewish experience or family experience? Was there anything that you kind of uh, linked in a way that made sense to you in working with the young people? Um, at the time, no. Um, in hindsight and as things would occur, yes. At the time, not really. For me, the Khmer Rouge was something quite different and separate from me as a person and me as a, a Western Australian educated female that was just another history lesson, I guess, even though it was quite recent. Um, when I started doing a lot of writing and writing articles and looking into the history of the Khmer Rouge, I started realising the similarities because they often refer to it as the Holocaust of Asia. So that sort of sparked my first interest in how does that work. Um, uh, and Danny and I discussed the other day, the, the thing that I noticed the most, I suppose, was working with these kids, and by kids, you know, a lot of them are 16, 18, 20, um, <clears throat> a lot of them are the children of the survivors. So their parents were the ones that were in uh, the Khmer Rouge. A lot of them have lost their parents, so they're orphans because of it. So when I think about the Jewish community and the Holocaust, my parents' generation are the children of the, of the Holocaust survivors. And so in me working with teenagers and working with 20-year-olds who are in families of survival, I can see the similarities here of our parents' generations. You know, they've also had to learn to survive because they grew up in those kinds of households. So I, I could relate to that when I was working with these kids, just the type of family that they were coming from and the different uh, ways they were brought up and that real survival. Everything was pure survival rather than 
kind of love and you know it was happy times it was just let's just survive and you can feel that in different parts of the Jewish community also um, you've as you mentioned your, your trainer has worked um, as a counsellor for, for many years what do you think you brought with that skill set to your work with Tiny Tunes um, one of the first things I noticed when I got there was that there was no counselling or social service system or anything of the sort in Cambodia. Uh, at first I was thinking, how am I going to work in this, in this arena when there, there's no backup? You know, I worked in St Kilda for many years and even though it's, it's tough and I was working with drug users and, and heroin addicts and working on the streets and prostitutes, but I had a backup of everything under the sun, you know, there was nothing I couldn't get whilst I was in St Kilda. I could get you free accommodation tonight, I could get you free food, free bed, money, whatever you need, I would have access through, whether it's Centrelink or different services, and you're linked in. In Cambodia, there's nothing. When you're poor, you're just poor. If you're a drug user, you're a drug user. If you have nowhere to sleep, you have nowhere to sleep. That's it. And that really freaked me out because I had no backup, I just had me. So the first thing I did was go and learn the language. So I spent a month doing an intense Khmer language training, and then I had a private tutor, and I went every morning before work. And then I was able to work in Khmer, in their language, and as soon as I was able to do that, it meant I could counsel. So my tutor, um, my tutor in Khmer, thought I was completely mad. <laughs> she was this really, really sweet young girl and she really, she desperately wanted to teach me polite language and how to be formal and respect my elders. And I was the oldest in the entire organisation. The founder of my organisation was younger than me and all of my staff were former street kids. The oldest in the room, well, the oldest in the centre was maybe 25 years old. So I was the oldest, I was the manager. So there was no respect or elder or higher up person, but she really wanted to teach me that and she wanted to teach me how to buy bananas in the market and how to negotiate a tuk-tuk driver. And I'd be like, yeah, 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 okay, tuk-tuk, no problem. So how do you say ice? And how do you say smoke ice? And how do you say drunk? And how do you say friendship, honesty, family, trust, commitment, all of these words? And she would just be freaking out, wondering what I was talking about. And I would say to her, I need to know how to counsel in Khmer to make my job efficient. And then by the end she got it and we would do practice counselling sessions as if I was doing a counselling session and she would allow me to do that as long as I did her homework first. And so um, <laughs> but it meant that I could really, really use my skills as a counsellor and that for me was huge. Really different, Count, you can't do counselling, the words, the terminology doesn't exist in Cambodia. So I would say to my kid, like one of the boys, if I could see he was struggling, I'd like, you know, let's go and grab a coffee in the tuk-tuk. And we'd grab a coffee and we'd go and sit in one of our own tuk-tuks and just hang out. And then I would start probing him with questions and trying to get to the bottom of what was going on. And they were my counselling sessions. And then uh, the university in Phnom Penh started its first ever social work degree. And I became one of the mentors of the social work uh, department and I will take in their students and give them work experience. You said before that um, you had no backup. Um, what is commonplace in, in counselling frameworks in Australia is debriefing and supervision and all those kinds of things. What did you have to get you through some of that stuff and process some of the, the harshness of it? Uh, depending on the day. Some days there was alcohol. <laughs> Beer helps. <laughs> Some days there was going out dancing. Um, some days I just went home and cried. Uh, I had very, very good housemates who are still my closest friends and they would listen to me endlessly. <laughs> um, I did have a free online counselling service that I could contact. I contacted her twice. Um, she was in Australia and it was helpful in that I had someone to talk to but she clearly never been to Asia and she just really had no comprehension of what I was talking about. So um, I journal a lot, so I, I write a lot and yeah, you just, you just deal with it. You break down later, there's no time. At the time there's no time for breakdowns. Whatever issues you're going through, 
is nothing compared to their daily lives. And like people would say, you have a bed to go home to, you have food on the table, you can go out for a drink if you want. They don't have those luxuries. So whatever you're going through is never going to be much on what, what they're going through. One of the things you mentioned in, um, in that piece is um, that in Cambodia, hip-hop is still considered anti-Khmer, um, and yet young people are drawn to it. Um, I was wondering what, what that actually means, and is, that, is it a deliberate strategy of the young people to stake their own claim, or is it, it something more complicated? I think, uh, I think breakdowns in hip-hop has always been part of the underworld. Uh, you see it coming out of the ghettos in America. You know, It's always had that underworld tone. Um, the founder of the organisation grew up very much in the hip-hop breakdown scene himself. And uh, I don't think it's a deliberate rebellious act, but I think it's something that they actually connect to, breakdance and hip-hop and using kind of all of that power on the dance floor can be really effective and it really works. And they create a bonding experience, the life skills that they learn that is probably not their intention, but the brotherhood and sisterhood that comes from breakdance and hip hop is, is a direct result of it, which is, a, which is fantastic. And at the center, we, we deliberately try and work with that whole issue of it being anti-Khmer so that it's not. And but often when we'll perform, we might start a performance with the monkey dance, which is a very popular uh, Cambodian dance and also in Thailand. And the monkey dance will then kind of transform into some flips and end up in a breakdancing thing, but trying to fuse Cambodian culture with hip hop culture and show that you don't need to have one or the other and that you can have both. So um, you've obviously written a, a relatively short piece um, about your experiences in Cambodia. You've written some more pieces. Is there a plan to put, pull them together as a volume or write something new? Yeah, so I published a, quite a few short stories about my work in Cambodia in different books, uh, anthology books around Hong Kong and Australia um, and India. The book that I'm writing at the moment is called Hip Hop and Hope from the slums of Phnom Penh. Um, it took me probably about eight months to write the book and I've been editing for about two, two years. <laughs> it's really hard to edit it. I hate editing. <laughs> um, I think also, you know, I've written articles for the Huffington Post called Are You a Perfectionist? And I really need to take my own advice on that. But it will never be good enough. It's such a deeply personal story, a deeply personal experience that I don't think any amount of editing will be good enough for, for how brilliant I need this book to be. It, just, it needs to be, you know, it needs to pay homage to these kids. It needs to be something that everyone can be really proud of. and. I, you know, it needs to be the best that it can be. And some of the parts of the book were, were so difficult to write. You know, I wrote one of the scenes or the chapters six months after I finished the book because it was just too emotional for me to get involved and get back to that space. So, you know, you write through tears and you can't even see your laptop and, you know, it's quite an emotional experience. Editing. Any, any editors in the audience? <laughs> Um, so you you now live in Thailand. Why the move? Um, I I moved to Thailand essentially to finish writing my book Hip Hop and Hope. <laughs> Didn't quite work out that way, but um, I moved there to write this book. Um, I've been looking at different jobs in Cambodia. I've been there a few years over my contract, and. Um, I wanted to get some distance and some space from, from my kids also to be able to really concentrate on writing the book and I wanted to be able to focus purely on writing the book without engaging in anything else. So I made the move, uh, did work on the book and then got sidetracked by mm. life and all sorts of wonderful other adventures that I wrote about also. So it's a dark and gloomy and somewhat wet evening in Melbourne. Tell us where you live in Thailand. Mm. Yeah. It's summer in Thailand right now, which probably isn't as amazing as that sounds. It's really hot. Um, I live um, on the southeast islands, so Phuket and Phi Phi is the southwest. I live on the southeast. So um, I live on a beautiful island in a really small beach area that's full of artists and hippies and wonderful people. 
And yeah, it's it's fantastic, and the water is crystal clear blue, and the sand is lovely, and I walk through a jungle to get to work, and um, my biggest decision is, should I wear my thongs, and where are they? <laughs> you, yeah, more strength to you, that's really tough. 